Hello and welcome back to the Val Report Show. I'm Ryan Sylvia, joined by Noah Taylor. We're with ValReport.com on the Rivals Network. And basketball season is already over, at least the regular season part of it is. Feels like it just started yesterday, but Tennessee has been crowned the SEC regular season champions and will begin their SEC tournament run tomorrow uh, in, in just a couple hours from when we're recording this. LSU, Mississippi State, they'll square off. We'll figure out who Tennessee will play in the quarterfinals. But I figured now would be a good time that we can go back, look at our podcast from before the season started, look at those season predictions and kind of grade ourselves and talk about how things have changed or maybe how we've been on the money. So without further ado, let's hop into it the same way we hopped into that show. Talking about March Madness, it's all that really matters in this sport, how well you do in that tournament. We both said the Elite Eight going into the season. We said Final Four is on the table, National Championship is on the table, but we settled with Elite Eight we felt good about. Has that changed for you or are you still sticking with that? Gosh, you know, it's so hard, I think, to get to a Final Four that I feel like Elite Eight would be, you know, it, 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 I will say this, it's kind of that that's kind of the bare minimum for this team. Uh, I think I, I would still probably say Elite Eight just because, you know, you never know. This team right now obviously has the makeup of a Final Four team. If they get there, if they get to the national championship, I think I think we agreed on that, you know, a few months ago that it would not shock us. I'll stick with Elite Eight. Uh, but, man, I, I mean, it's certainly a Final Four to, and a national champ. Being those one of those last two teams, I could see for sure. But I'll, I'll stay with Elite Eight for now. Yeah, I'll stick with Elite Eight as well. I think that's still a really good season if you get to that point. And like we said before the year, I think that this team could win a national championship. I think this team could go to the Final Four. They could do whatever they want to do. They're that good. But right now, if I had to put money on it, where is this team going to finish their season? I feel like Elite Eight is the safest bet. So that's what I'll go with right now, which, like I said, second ever in program history. So – You can't hate too much on it. Of course, you would love a Final Four for the first time, and this team's good enough to go however far they want, but Elite Eight is nothing to kind of knock at. Talking about the SEC, we shared our SEC uh, preseason predictions. First of all, really funny to listen back and talk about how Tennessee is 1A and Arkansas is 1B heading into the year, (laughs) and then looking at what Arkansas did having to beat Vanderbilt in overtime on the first day of the SEC tournament yesterday just to keep their season alive. Uh, show, shows you that, you know, those preseason rankings only carry so much weight, but one of the preseason rankings was Tennessee was going to win the SEC, and we both agreed. You had an outright title for the Vols. They claimed that. I had a shared title, so I get half credit, I, I guess, because they ended up doing it uh, in sole possession. But what did you think about that SEC slate? Did it surprise you at all at any point that Tennessee was able to pull it off? I mean, I – it, it's it's I know Rick Barnes has said this a bunch and of course he's going to talk up his league uh he he has done that ever since he's been here I feel but I mean I, I do think he's right this is as tough as it's ever been um you know I think maybe at the beginning of the year you you say things you make predictions at least in my case I'm not always like a hundred percent this is what I you know there's always that little bit of doubt I guess in the back of your mind when you make predictions um felt okay about that but I think once you saw what they were able to do, you know, early, pretty early on when they they beat Ole Miss, when Ole Miss came into Knoxville ranked, uh, I think they were. I think Ole Miss was undefeated uh, maybe at that point uh, after after a pretty manageable non conference schedule. Obviously, you had the loss at Mississippi State, but you know, you come from behind at Georgia, and I think it was that Georgia game, you know, playing on the road when Georgia still looked like a pretty solid team. You, you were down double digits in the second half, let a let a halftime lead pretty commanding halftime lead slip away. Uh, maybe in that moment and early in the second half of that game, I had some doubts about where this team would finish. But I think when Dalton Connect kind of took over that game, you, you felt you started to feel pretty good about what this team was able to do and that there weren't going to be a lot of games that that they would lose. And, and that ended up being the case. I, I wouldn't say I was shocked that they won it outright, but uh, incredibly impressive feat. Obviously followed it up with one of the toughest – non-conference schedules in college basketball, maybe the toughest non-conference schedule, and then jumped right into SEC play when SEC has been as tough as it's been in a long time. And and to come out, I mean, whatever else Tennessee accomplishes this year, I know they've got a lot of a lot of big goals, but that one has to be up there for sure because of the strength of, of this league. 
Well, I'm not necessarily surprised that they won it, but there was a stretch where you looked at what the schedule had left and you looked at those South Carolina, Alabama, Kentucky, Auburn games that are left on the schedule and you saw the little margin for error Tennessee had for winning an SEC title. And it was like, man, this seems good enough to do it, but I don't know if anyone can. So I'm not going to say I'm shocked that they won it, but it was, like you said, just really impressive that they were able to finish how they did and, and get that done with that road win against South Carolina, who is probably the most surprising team in the SEC this year, but was a really tough out for Tennessee, considering especially they lost their first meeting in Knoxville. So both, uh, I'm a little bit right. You're right on that one. We move on to, will they have an improved offense? That was a big talk uh, going into the year. Obviously, Rick Barnes' team's defense first, but that was part of the reason that maybe they got bounced in that Sweet 16 against FAU is, man, can, can this offense just take that next step and be a little bit more reliable, or is there still going to be those stretches where you're pulling teeth trying to get points on the board? Your quote was, it'll maybe be the best we've seen in a very long time under Barnes. You feel like that was the case? Yeah, and I, I think we've talked about it on this show, you know, conversations on, on back from road games in the car. We've talked about, you know, Dalton Connect being that guy. That that was the piece that Tennessee needed. You go back, you mentioned that Sweet 16. That That's that's where Tennessee lost games last year and in, in the years prior, you know, under Rick Barnes was incredibly elite defenses, but those scoring, those stretches of scoring droughts, just just plagued them. And now you don't really have that problem. You had a little bit of it early against Kentucky on Saturday in a game that, you know, outside of being a rivalry game was was fairly meaningless. But for the most part, every time Tennessee needed a guy to take over a game, Dalton Connect answered the call pretty much every time. And that, that was the piece you needed, uh, I think, that to make this team go from from really, really good to now national championship caliber, final four caliber. And he's been that guy. We saw it early in non-conference play. Wondered if it would carry over to SEC play, and it, and it certainly did. And, and he's the big reason why we're talking about them winning a championship, SEC championship, and why we're talking about them, you know, doing something this program's never done before. He was that that piece Tennessee needed uh, for the last couple of years, and uh, certainly fans are, are very happy about that. I'll give myself half credit again. I said it'll sit mid to high seventy points per game. They end the season at eighty point two, so I'm I'm not gonna take credit for that one. I thought it'd be somewhere around seventy seven. But I did say it would not be as good as the 2018 to 19 season. Maybe a little bit surprising, but that 2018 to 19 team, 82 points per game, yeah. so about two uh, points less per match, which which is not an insane amount, but two points less per match than that 2018 to 19 team that ultimately lost to Purdue in the Sweet 16. Of course, Grant Williams leading the way, another SEC Player of the Year alongside Connect, and, and then you get efforts from Admiral Schofield, Jordan Bowen, Kyle Alexander, Lamonte Turner, Jordan Bowden. Eve Ponds, you get on the list, that team was absolutely stacked. But this offense obviously much improved from the last couple of years since that season and was kind of a reason they won a couple of those games. I don't know if Tennessee goes into Rep Arena and puts up 100 and is able to win that game last year. This year they're able to do it, and not even just because of Dalton Connect, because you get almost 30 points from Josiah Jordan James. You get good efforts from Zakai Ziegler, Santiago Vescovi, and, and other guys sprinkled in as well. And it, it, it is the reason that this team could go far, like you said. It's the difference between this team and maybe some years in the past where not only do you still have the elite defense, number three on Ken Palm, but now you have a top 20 offense or top 25 offense as well to go with it, and that's what makes this team so lethal. Noah, leading score predictions. You had Santiago Vescovi. <laughs> Obviously not correct, but I'm not going to hold that against you because I think that was the popular guess going into the season. That was what a lot of people would have said is, hey, you get this guy returning, uh, fifth-year senior who's proven he can score a lot in the past. Logically, he's going to take another step up and, and be a big scorer, but he's been a lot more passive on the offensive end, stepped up his defensive game a lot, I think, has become a much better passer uh, even as an off-ball guard. So I'm not going to hold it against you, but what were your thoughts on Santiago Vescovi's season this year? Yeah, it, it was surprising, uh, I think, more to start. I think as the year went on and, and you know, you and I both being around those press conferences during the week and being around the team during the week, it seemed very genuine that that he had accepted what his new role was. And, and so it was less surprising as the year went on. But early on, yeah, I, you were kind of waiting for that. And obviously there's still a lot of tournament time left to play, you would you would hope, if you're a Tennessee fan. 
So maybe there, that game will come, but there just hadn't been that game that we kind of thought after a slow start that, that Santiago Vescovi would, would kind of turn it on and, and do a little bit of what he did last year, have his own chance to take over games like Dalton Connect has. It hasn't happened. I think that, you know, Tennessee can live with that certainly because they found other ways to do it. Dalton Connect obviously being the catalyst, but you mentioned that Kentucky game in Rupp, one of the best wins of the season. You know, the, having a game like Josiah Jordan James had where he scores almost 30 points, I think that was a career high for him. Having a game like Zakai Ziegler had, um, that that was really – you were kind of waiting for Santi to kind of have one of those as well. Uh, it just hasn't really come yet. Maybe it will. But, uh, yeah, I am was a lot surprised beginning of the year that he didn't have that, you know, what he was doing last year. A uh, little bit less surprised, though, after being around the team a little bit more. Yeah, and that was something that Rick Barnes talked a little bit about at his press conference on Wednesday about how, hey, if you're open, Vescovy, shoot the shot. Like, like he still feels good about where Vescovy is uh, as a shooter and, and feels confident if he's taking that in rhythm catch and shoot three, which we've seen him pass up a couple times. And of course, if you have a guy like Dalton Connect go for 40 points per game uh, and, and drop all these crazy numbers then someone's going to have to take a little bit of a backseat. And, and you mentioned how Vescovy was very open to that and just wanted to win basketball games and quickly realized, hey, we have a generational scorer on our team. I don't need to be taking as many shots as maybe I was in the past. So I, I'm not too surprised, uh, like you said, as the season progressed, that this is what it ended up looking like for Vescovy. But he has had some good games. You, you look at the loss to Kansas, he drops 21 on 50% shooting, Five for 11 on three corners. That's a good outing for him against Illinois. A big win at home. He has 12, and that felt like a really positive effort from him. And you go down the list, and he's just kind of been steady in a lot of these games. Ole Miss, big win, drops 11. Alabama at home, drops 10. At Vanderbilt, a game that was a little bit sketchy at times, scores 12. South Carolina, a, a game where they got almost all their production from Dalton Connect, that loss at home, he scores 10. You go to Rep Arena, he scores 11 and hits some big shots. Vanderbilt comes back, he scores 12. So there's games sprinkled in where he scores zero, like, like he did on senior day, or maybe one or two or three points. But there was games, too, where he was a really positive impact uh, for this team uh, as well. Let's move on to underrated player. Noah, you had Jemai Meshack. Do you feel like he he lived up to, to your expectations for him? Yeah, you know, I, I can't remember – exactly what I, I I thought maybe he would take a, another step offensively. Um, you know, I, cause I, I think you kind of, we all kind of knew what we were going to get defensively from Jamai and it was good. It was even better than last year. Um, that, that offensive step didn't really come like it. Maybe I thought I thought it would, but uh, again, but you know, you go back to like you mentioned about Vescovy, Jamai had a couple of those games too, not maybe not in the scoring production, but hitting big shots, you go to that, Alabama game in, in Tuscaloosa that, you know, almost secures the, or secures the number one spot for you. And uh, he hits a big shot in that game. So he had a couple moments like that, but um, I think you kind of knew what you were going to get out of him defensively. And and he was such a huge part of that for Tennessee, especially in those two Alabama wins. Yeah. I thought Jermaine Meshack had a really nice year for me. I went with Jordan Ganey, uh, a guy that had a lot of question marks around him going into the year. Hasn't done it at a high level. Is he going to come in and, and be an impact immediately? What's it going to look like? And I thought he had another really solid year, uh, comparable to Jemai Meshack's guys that came off the bench and uh, were big contributions in some wins. So obviously, you point to the Jemai Meshack. It's more on the defensive end. You look at what he did against Alabama and all of that. Jordan Ganey more the opposite, where he became a spark on offense, especially early in the year. I, I think a lot of people forget that. Early in the year when this team was trying to figure out who it was, it was Dalton Connect scoring, and then it was Jordan Ganey having really, really nice games as well. He slowed down by the end of the year in, in some regards, but he had games as well where, where he hit some really big shots for Tennessee. And I feel like you can't be too upset with having a guy come off your bench who can shoot the ball like Jordan Ganey can and has improved so much on the defensive end. Of course, he's not an elite defender by any means right now, but the effort's clear. He knows where he needs to be. And obviously Rick Barnes is pleased enough with it if he's going to see any minutes on the court because we know how Rick Barnes and his teams operate. So I, I feel like both of us kind of hit the money there. Jemai Meshack, Jordan Ganey going into the year, didn't exactly know what to expect. Both of them put together some pretty solid seasons. Last thing we have on the agenda, we had bold predictions. Yours was you didn't want to pick Final Four. You didn't want to pick SEC Player of the Year. 
because those felt too easy. Well, Final Four, we'll see. SEC Player of the Year was locked up by Dalton Connect, so you would have been on the money if you went with that one. <laughs> but you said that they will have an improved three-point percentage. This year, it was 34.6% from three as a team. Last year, it was 329 So you got the mark that you were looking for. <laughs> what were your thoughts on, on what this team was able to do from distance? Yeah, it kind of goes back to just what they – just how the offense has changed, you know, and, and being able to do that, hitting those those big threes and moments that they needed them. You know, when we saw Dalton Connect take over games, that was a big reason why, you know, all of a sudden he'd come down the court. I think back to the Auburn. Yeah, you, you could pick really any. You could pick at Vandy. You could pick that Georgia game. You could pick Mississippi State game. I know that was a loss, but that, that ended up – they tie it late because he comes down the floor, hits a three, the next thing you know he's hitting two, three, four threes in a row or getting a layup here and there and – and then taking over. So obviously he was a big reason why, but I think that was, that was the most impressive thing was hitting big shots and, and big moments for this team. And Jordan Ganey, a guy you just mentioned coming off the bench, he was able to do it too. Zakai had his moments doing that. Josiah had his moments. Desante had his moments. I think just overall, I, I was really impressed with, with this team's ability for one, not to go away when it looked like their games were kind of slipping away from them late, but their ability to hit three point shots. I think that's, that was what was missing last year too. For me, I had Dalton Connect, first team, all SEC. Now it doesn't feel like a bold take <laughs> at, at all. But going into the year, I swear, uh, that, that didn't feel like it, w- it was a for sure thing. Obviously, he well exceeded my expectations. Uh, if you would have told me he would be nearly anonymous uh, SEC player of the year, uh, I would have probably not believed you. But here we are, and Dalton Connect might be the best player in college basketball this year. You can certainly make an argument for it. And if he's not the best, he's the second best. And I don't think you can really – argue that that he's any worse than second uh so don't connect i, I mean it, it's tough to to say stuff that we haven't been saying all year because he's been so consistent for tennessee through this point but easily first team all sec easily sec player of the year and, and that that's really what i'll leave it at is, is don't connect just puts together a phenomenal year I want to touch on one or two more things before we get out of here. First of all, SEC awards did come out the other day, like we talked about. Player of the Year, Dalton Connect. Defensive Player of the Year, Zakai Ziegler. First team, all SEC, Dalton Connect, Zakai Ziegler. Second team, Jonas Adu makes the list. And then looking at the all defensive teams, Zakai Ziegler and Jonas Adu. Anything surprise you from those awards? No, I think that those, those were, you know, obviously Dalton. You know, I, I agree with you at the beginning of the year it did feel like maybe a bold take because it was, I think, a little bit of – we knew that he was very productive at Northern Colorado, what little we did know about him before he arrived at Tennessee. But, yeah, the big question was would that translate? Certainly it did. I don't think there's any question there with with player of the year. Zakai, you know, a guy that's on pretty much every defensive player of the year watch list, wins it, you know, the league's defensive player of the year. Um, and and his, just his ability – I think his story helped a lot with that too, the fact that, you know, he had that injury, the, the ACL tear, and comes back a little over a year later and wins that award. And then Jonas Adu getting on, on both the, on the list uh, def, on the defensive team and then, you know, the second team as well. And I believe the AP SEC or voted him on the first team too. So he, so he made kind of both first and second from the league and the AP. And, and so – Nothing surprising there because Jonas, you know, we talked about it at the beginning of the year. You know, you could kind of tell early on that he was having his best season and, and it kind of accumulates with that with uh, some recognition. So he was as big a part for this team as, as Dalton was, I think, in some ways and played really well there uh, for the most part. Zakai Ziegler surprised me a little bit and not because he didn't deserve it. He definitely deserved the award. But when that was something that kind of came across the news desk or however you want to say it, when we found out, It was like, yeah, that makes sense. But I wasn't sure if he was going to get the recognition for what he does. Obviously, the steals are there. The you you see him pickpocket ball handlers all the time. But I feel like that's usually a war an award that goes to a a rim protector, a guy that gets all those blocks, and and you can kind of point to those stats a little bit more easier. I think it says a lot about who voted him defense player of the year, the coaches, because he must be such a headache for opposing coaches to deal with on the defensive end. You're trying to get into your action and you have Zakai Ziegler picking you up at half court half the time, full court pressing you sometimes, just disrupting everything. By the time it feels like you can catch your breath, get into your offensive set, you look up and there's 12 seconds on the shot clock. I feel like that has a little bit to do with with why he was given that award by the coaches is because more than anyone, coaches understand defensive impact and they probably looked at what Zakai Ziegler was doing 
as an opposing point guard and picking up ball handlers and just dreading that matchup and dreading every second of it while they were coaching on the sidelines. So like I said, it, it's very deserved from Zakai Ziegler, depending on, on what height you want to go with, with Tyler Ulis, he, he's the shortest to ever win it. Tyler Ulis, some places list him at 5'10", some at 5'9". Either way, third player under six feet tall to ever win SEC defensive player of the year. Really great award for him. Very well deserved. Uh, and really just a catalyst for this team on both ends. Zakai Ziegler, obviously Dalton Connect gets all the accolades and all the attention, but uh, this team's not where they are without Zakai Ziegler. And last thing I'll say about it, coming off an ACL almost a year ago, just a little bit over a year ago, he tore his ACL. That's held people out for a calendar year before. He comes back, he's ready for the season opener, a little bit of rest he has to shake off by this point. I, I mean, you, you could not tell at all. So really a remarkable story from Zakai and what he was able to do. Last thing, SEC tournament predictions. What's Tennessee going to do? They get their run started on Friday. Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah. What? Repeat that. I'm sorry, Ryan. SEC tournament predictions. Where do you think Tennessee is going to go? Yeah. Um, I. You know, I think that this team certainly wants to get to that championship. I. You know, it's kind of like the Kentucky game last week. You know, going into it from an outsider's perspective perspective certainly it's not a game that they need to win um just like this tournament you know maybe for that one seed because you are kind of it's coming down to the wire with North Carolina with Arizona and you want to and if you really want that one seed I think that you could really solidify that with with a deep run here in the SEC tournament but um I mean it's hard to pick against them at this point I think that they're playing so well and, and the Kentucky game is is you know on Saturday was kind of like one of those well Nothing really concerning there for me because if a player on you know on opposing team is going to shoot seventy percent from three point range and you know they're they're going to be able to score as well as they did and you're going to have multiple an opponent's going to have multiple guys score twenty seven points that could beat pretty much anybody in the country so I, I I think if if people are concerned about that at all I don't think there's anything too concerning about that performance I don't think that carries over um, I think the team will be locked in. Uh, you play LSU with a team you're familiar with. If you get them, Mississippi State, there's a little bit of a chip on your shoulder because that's the one one of the few SEC teams you haven't had a second shot at that beat you. So um, I, I think that there's a lot of motivation there from that standpoint. And if you really want that number one seed, I, I think that you you could make a good argument by a, a good showing in Nashville. I think you put it uh, in a really good way. It's tough to pick against them right now. Uh, it feels like any of the top five seeds could end up winning this crown, but it's tough to pick against Tennessee and how consistent they've been, how good they've been. So I'll, I'll tell you, I'll take Tennessee. I am not locking that in. I'm, I'm not putting it in stone or anything like that, but I, I do think Tennessee rightfully is the favorite. I think that there's the best chance that they take home the trophy and, and sweep the SEC uh, kind of championships this year in men's basketball. But like I said, it's going to be tough against whether it's South Carolina or Auburn in the quarter or in the semifinals. It's going to be tough whether it's Kentucky or Alabama in the finals, assuming that there's no upsets along the way. Any of those matchups are going to be difficult. Tennessee's well prepared, as prepared as anyone to get the job done. So I'll go with them. But also, like you noted, not the end of the world yeah. if they don't win this championship. As we started the show, Teams are judged on what they do in the NCAA tournament. So they could lose this first game to LSU Mississippi State. I guarantee no one cares if yeah. they move to the Elite Eight or farther. No one will even think about that twice. So something something to note, uh, but uh, we'll find out. We'll be in Nashville. We'll head over tomorrow for Tennessee's first game. Stay as long as the Vols let us. Uh, we'll have coverage from Nashville, from Bridgestone Arena, from the SEC tournament on site every single day over at ballreport.com. Spring practice begins on Monday. Uh, we were talking about it earlier, how excited we are for football season to kind of feel like it's back. Uh, of course, it's still a ways away from that August 31st first kick uh, of the season, but spring practice, always a fun time. You'll have three things to look out for right after this show drops. So head over to ballreport.com to get that spring practice preview. And then, of course, pictures, videos, notes, press conferences, everything you need football related content is coming over at ballreport.com and baseball season as well. 
officially SEC play. That feels crazy to say. It does not feel like this out-of-conference slate should be over already. But this weekend, Tennessee travels to Tuscaloosa to get SEC play started. We'll have content on that as well as the Vols are off to a really hot start. I just dropped three things that we learned in out-of-conference play that this Tennessee team touched on. Uh, Dean Curley how good he's been as a freshman and how you have Ariel Antigua right behind him. Who's recovering from injury. Just the brightness that that middle infield looks like it will have throughout the next year or, or throughout the future. And then some other things as well that we picked up on throughout the out of conference slate. So everything you need under the umbrella of Tennessee athletics over at ballreport.com links to everything you need is in the description. Thank you for watching.